Uh, yeah, so welcome everyone to the R Tables workshop for R in Medicine. Um, we're going to be talking um, and and teaching about the R Tables framework for creating uh, both exploratory and sort of regulatory submission style tables uh, using R. Um, and go ahead, the next slide, Adrian. Yes. So I am a uh, statistical computing consultant. I'm the architect and lead developer of the R tables package and related packages. Um, and my education is that I have a PhD in statistics with a focus on statistical computing. Uh, and my co-host is Adrian. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, I'm a principal research software engineer at Genentech. Um, here in the Bay Area. And um, previously I worked in Roche in Switzerland and I was um, the technical lead of, an ASP, of a project called Nest, where we developed um, software in R to, to perform exploratory and um, regulatory clinical trial analysis. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, and also my, by training, I have a PhD in statistics. Good. Um, yes, yeah, so maybe I, I'll take this one here. So, so the, the trade, so the um, the slides are here. I think Gabe, you've already shared them in the chat. Yeah, in the uh, in the Q and A. So if you if you guys go to the Q and A, the, under answered, um, okay. Hannah Hill um, asked about links, uh, and so I've posted both the code repo and the slide deck uh, there. So you can follow along uh, yes. as desired. And I see people are joining right now. So once you're here, please jump to the third slide. And um, so this time we have not set up an R Studio Clown session. Um, um, so if you have, please use your local R installation. Also, we have less, it's less of an exercises workshop. Like we give you the code, we run through it. We take time to discuss it with you. Um, and we'll receive, receive that um, is um, a good format. And we test this format this time. So you can go, you can clone that repository. The repos I have it here on my desktop. Once you have cloned it, you can go to your R Studio um, and you can open project. And then it should look something like there's a supplementary code. Um, it should look something like this. And do even if you have R tables installed, do be sure to do that uncomment and run that uh, remotes install R tables, uh, because some of the features that we will be talking about um, are very new, um, and so they will be uh, available in that on the main branch in the GitHub repo, and they'll be available in the next CRAN, um, but they are not released in the current release on CRAN um are other people uh it looks like there are some attendees that are having trouble accessing the google docker it looks like other people are able to to view that is that correct yes there's there 30 34 people yeah. i think for those who you doesn't work try maybe to use um chrome or a different browser um yeah i'm not uh i'm not sure but we will be we will be showing the slides as we're going through them. Um, and so she will still be able to sort of see what's going on. And then perhaps we can we can try to um, troubleshoot that after the fact. Because um, it looks it looks like it is working for most people. So um, I don't have access to the Google Doc. That is very unlikely because anyone with a link. Yeah, they should be able to do it. Type answer. I'll add the official link here. That's the yeah, and that's the same link that I that I put in the in the original. Um, so, yeah. So Stephen, go to answered questions, mm -hmm. and that um, that link should work. But I think we should go ahead and and move forward, Good. Adrian. Good. Yes, and so maybe then you can do the um, slide four. Yes. So, um, I think very important is that and we 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 keep coming back to that. Um, we have a very, very exhaust. It's a big project. It's used by many downstream. We have um, um, 
we have lots of documentation, both of the, all the functions, and there's lots of them. Um, if you have browsed it, and then we have many, many um, vignettes. Um, so yes, um, currently the version we use for this workshop is our table six uh, zero six one nine thousand and two. We have installation instruction in the script, but also later there's a slide. So I'll pass the ball back to Gabe. Um, okay. Um, right. So um, what is our table? So our tables is a general table generation and rendering framework uh, that particularly targets ASCII, but does support other um, output formats like RTF and, and PDF. Um, that is the, the sort of feature space is informed by the need, the regulatory needs for pharmaceutical companies that are conducting clinical trials. Um, but our tables itself is not actually specific to clinical trials. It is just built in a way that supports the types of really complex, multi-faceted tables that um, that are involved in clinical trial submission. Um, and so they can it can be used to um, to generate the overwhelming majority of of tables that are involved in a clinical trial submission and any that they that it can't those very very few that it can't it can generate a table with um, fully equivalent information um, that it just has a slightly different form um, and we're going to talk a little bit about how it does that actually not a little bit. we're going to talk quite a bit about how it does that over the course of these three hours but um, basically it has uh, a layouting engine that allows you to declare what the table structure is going to be, and then it will do the sort of computations necessary to generate the cell values and place and organize them into a table for you. So it's a it's a it's a system that it, that has a lot of power in terms of uh, the you give it sort of very expressive instructions and then it will actually go and, and construct the tables for you. Um, and then, yeah, it has, it supports these multiple rendering outputs. So go ahead. Yeah. Oh, so that's, yeah, I'm going to um, talk a little about the ecosystem or yeah, or the, the downstream use of our tables. Um, so, R tables is a fairly low level tool to create tables. Um, and and as you go to productionize, like as you have like as an organization, not it's um most of those tables are standard tables, um, and some of them are at least repeated patterns. And so we don't do any real analysis in our tables. It's really only the co core components to do. Um, what you will learn in this course, date like splitting and um, like creating essentially a table um, and uh, like defining analysis and providing structured objects that it can query and work with. And so the analysis part um, is in a package called turn. That's what you see here. So turn essentially uses um, rights components that can be used together with our tables to make um, clinical trial tables, standard, like, like common clinical trial tables. And we have a and we have a um, project called the TLG catalog that is um, by now also open source. And so maybe it's good to quick open that and spend some time looking at that. Um, and then in the whole context of clinical trial data analysis, there's a downstream part where you would say, well, those are st standard tables. We don't need to have any parametrization, or very few. There's a package called Chevron, which I'm not so sure if that's open source yet. Um, but let's quick look at the TLG catalog. As I said, it's open source to everyone. And here you have the 200 plus tables um, essentially available for everyone. Um, and so they use a mix between turn and R tables. Um, so you can look at adverse events tables. There's a certain naming. I think those are not um, industry standards, but um, I think, I mean, there's safety summary, not as title to it. Um, usually when you look at an output, not so that the, the AT01, it's an adverse events table. Um, it has number of components. Um, 
There's, there is the standard table, um, how it looks like. There is, um, and so each of them, like, there's, there's, so those are the variations. Not the first step is how do we get to the data? Um, then you have the different variation flavors of this table. Then usually in the end, you have the teal tab. Teal is a also an S-based project to create shiny apps. It's also open source. Um, you can look on insights engineering for teal, or you can go and look other presentations on teal in part by me um, on YouTube, you should find something. So it's a very powerful framework to interactively subset data, um, choose the encoding, it creates the table, that's an R table. Um, and it's in fact the R table that's used here. And um, there's a show R code, so there's reproducibility um, part of it. Um, and so if you look at those standard, like if you look at the the table, that's how the table looks, um, printed as ASCII, with ASCII characters. Um, you can look at the code. Um, let me first spend a minute on the data setup. We use synthetic data. We They are created with a package called random CDS data. It's public. Those then, once we deploy the package, so once the, the current NAS team deploys the package, they um, they put it into an archive, the random CDs data, that's called um, synthetic data archive. And then the attack, you can say, I would like to have the latest ADSL data set available in the synthetic CDs data repository. Um, that gives you two data sets, usually to get the outputs that you need. Um, because that, like, it's fairly simple. You can look in random CDs data. There needs to be some post-processing, what you see usually in the data setup, Part. And then if you go to the actual table code, not so I would like to create this table, you can look, well, not the session info, sorry. The code, you can look, well, those are the variables of interest. And now we are in in our tables territory. Count values is a, is a turn function. Basic table is an R tables function. Build table is an R table function. And that's essentially how you get the table displayed. Um, and so it can go through all the tables um, and that's the pattern um, to efficacy, to lab results, to, um, to yeah, to lots of, lots of table nuts. Um, so I encourage you to look into that, um, but um, because I think we think most of the table that are required for clinical trial reporting, you should be able to find here. It might not match your company's um, exact light specification. We can talk a little bit in the, um, like, I think the first question is, does it matter? The second question is we can uh, we can discuss that in there. Like there's different formats so, for so entering. One, one yeah. second, uh, Adrian, I just want to address a, a question that we got. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to click the answer live. Um, and then, um, so Karina asked, Karina Sulin asked uh, whether you can reuse this code. Yes. So this, all of this code is open source under a commercially permissible open source license. Uh, so you can use this code um, and to make these tables. Uh, Turn is open source. It is available on GitHub under the Insights Engineering Organization. And it will soon be on CRAN. It is not on CRAN yet, but it will be soon. Um, our tables is already on CRAN in addition to the formatters, which is a sort of underlining helper package, essentially. Uh, so yes, the answer is you can, this code is available and um, and you can use it. It's, uh, it is it is permissively licensed so that you can so that you can just reuse this this code. Yes, and I think it's fair to say that, um, like, I think I mean at least in my view, um, the first step was see this not standardizing the data. I hope that that work around here that the industry can find a way forward and move choose something. I mean, I hope it's this, maybe it's something else, not. And that would be the next phase of making it easier to review the data and to share the data with health authorities. Um, it's essentially standardize the code, not use the same tooling um, 
to to create the outputs um and that's one um, or at the very oh, least standardize the tables or standardize the table yes right so I think that's a fairly big step here that we create all of those tables and share show look it can be done and that's how it looks and that's a good discussion starting point for the industry to decide is this good enough what needs to be changed um or is or is it completely in the wrong direction yeah so so i think that so the whole reason to spend that much time on that slide is to show that there's really lots of work that builds on our tables um and also it's fairly exhaustive in in i think in many downstream uses in reporting clinical trial tables um and let me quick see the next slides i'm going to cover quickly and then i pass the ball back ball back to, to gabe so as i've mentioned there are six six categories 250 table 225 table variants um from various different um, domains um and um if if you then get more into into that topic um i've, I've also briefly mentioned that um like our tables is the core general um, table package for layouting and tabulation and rendering um, and turn implements essentially analysis statistical calculations um, and you can't use turn without our tables um, so you can I think you can learn turn with beginner in, um, understanding of our tables but you don't get get around learning some R tables to use term efficiently then of course the more you become an advanced user um, of term the more you want to learn about our table so here's the url um, again examples are on the tlg catalog and so maybe gabe if you want to talk yeah uh, so another another sort of piece of work in that same vein is the R Consortium has a working group on R tables for regulatory submission with bo which both Adrian and I have been heavily involved in. Um, and that working group, unlike the TLG catalog, which is, you know, specific to turn plus R tables and solves a wide, wide variety of, of tables with just that that one sort of framework with uh, with the extension of turn. Um, this working group uh, represents you know multiple table generating packages and multiple pharmaceutical companies have, are involved uh, in this working group. Um, and then you know sort of Adrian and I are the representatives for for the R tables approach, but it is not specific to the R tables approach um and yeah so you can see here one of the things that we the primary thing that this working group has been doing is writing a book about tables uh in in r um and the structure of this book is that you can see there are you know either six or seven tables packages represented um and then there are five, I believe, archetypal table example tables that are then worked from raw CDISC data all the way to table um, in all of these different um, in all of these different table engine packages. So, um, so that uh, is another uh, good resource, and that this book has been, you know, it's a it's been a, a long effort by the working group to to put all of this together um and you can see as as adrian is showing like this is live just on the github so you can see the draft of the book at any time by going to the to that um repository um and in addition to that we are slated to release the first official edition electronically of the book um the edition one so to speak on the 23rd of this month um so that we will probably continue to you know add to and refine the book uh there's been discussions of adding in you know topics like listings and things like that um in a future edition but the but the current edition which is basically what i just described the sort of six table engines and and five different substantially different archetypal tables 
um, in each of those systems, that's going to be what's in edition one. And that um, that is something that we will be sort of officially publishing um, later this month. In addition to, as I, as as we can see, the you know whatever the latest draft version uh, being available right there live on the on the web page on the um, on the repo. So, so that's another good re resource in terms of. Um, being aware of what table engines are out there and what they can do, and um, and looking at code that actually generates. Um, and there, are each of those, each of the tables, um, there is a turn a, a pure R table solution, and for some of them, there is also a turn solution um, in this book. And there are likely turn solutions to all of them in the TLG catalog as well plus many 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 more tables as we saw so that's the other sort of larger context piece um and then after that i think we will get into the specifics of so i think this one you covered not yes yeah and, uh, yes um so should I actually, should I actually run those too quick. Um, I said I know it's your name to it, but I can quick. Yeah, you can. Um, so yeah, this is just like like we mentioned before. The um, it's important if you want to run all of the code in the in that supplementary code file in the in the repo that you have the latest GitHub version of R tables. Um, so you can install R tables from CRAN, which will pull in all of its dependencies, and then you can install. Um, the GitHub version of our tables, which will then get you that sort of latest bleeding edge version of just just our tables. So there we go. And we can see that's the that's the version that Adrian mentioned, the zero six one nine zero zero two. Uh and there you go. So then you will have the version that has there are two new functions that we'll be talking about here that are that are new to that version. Um, that are were sort of developed as we were developing this workshop, um, and then all of the rest of the functions, you know, have been in there for a long time and would even be in the CRAM version. So, um, yeah. So this is just we're, so we're going to deal all the tables that we use. Almost all the tables we use in our examples are going to be based on the um, sort of synthetic ADSL data set that actually ships with our tables. Um, called x underscore ADSL. Um, there it's our table ships with um, relatively small synthetic versions of many of the CDISC data set specifications, not every single one, but many of them it does have. And the one that we'll be using here is ADSL. Um, so we can see here we've got, you know, standard um, ADSL uh, variables that we're going to, some of which we're going to be using to create the uh, the tables, many of the tables that we're going to go through. So Good. go ahead. Good. And then this Adrian is going to talk about, this is one of the new functions. Uh, so go ahead. Good. Let me actually turn off some, um, um, let me see bookmarks. I don't want to view the bookmarks here. Show all the story to maximize that. Good. So, um, we have added a new so for this for this workshop uh, because if we have now ran ran a couple of um, trainings on our tables, and um, and we thought it would be nice actually to maybe make a little bit of simpler um, entry into our tables, um, and so it's heavily leaning on ggplot, qplot, quickplot. We have now a Q table um, that is part of the current. Um, of essentially what's on that branch. That's why we we have you install this um, from for directly from GitHub. We're going to release it on Gran. And so Q table is for creating generalized cross tables. It's a little bit more than table. And so we're going to go into those details right now. Um, so I think 
everyone who has used R probably has used a table function. And usually it's a factor variable that goes in um, if it's string, that it also works with strings. But if it's a factor variable, it makes one, it gives back an, um, a table object with, if it's one dimensional, if it's cross table, it gives a 2D, but um, with essentially one column here or um, per factor level, and then the counts of how many, how many observation of um, arm A drug X are in that factor variable, how many of B and so on. And so if you give a second variable, you get a cross table um, with frequency counts, um, with the counts of um, um, how many are female in A and male in B and so on. And so let me run that. Is that big enough, Gabriel? Should I make it larger, my font? Is that um, maybe, I can see um, it okay. Um, maybe the audience, if you if you would like me to um, would like me to increase the font, please write. I guess in the questions or in the chat. Um, well, I don't see the chat right now. Um, yes. So, yeah, so that's a that's like, yeah. that's a common very common way. If you look at the variable itself, um, um, it's a factor level. It's a factor variable. Um, it has the levels, and because in CDisk there is data set labels, and the way R deals with the variable labels, so data set and variable labels, and the way R deals with the labels, it's an attribute label to the variable. And just maybe for um, those of you who use R Studio, um, R Studio has added essentially support for visualizing the labels in the um, viewer. Um, anyway, that's besides the, but that's what you see here. More important, these are the factor levels. These are the elements. If you're on table on that, you get um, um, one dimensional, two dimensional um, frequency counts. And so if you, if we do the same thing in Q table, um, which is part of our tables, quick table, it's a little bit different. The first argument is a data set. And then the second argument is um, the rows, the variable name um, that should be used for the rows. And then the set uh, to summarize, like to split by the rows and then the set to summarize the rows. And then the third argument is the variable name um, for summary in the column space. Um, and so if you do that, um, and so that, so, I mean, it's clear from the thing now that this is a variable. This here, the variable is referred to with a string. We don't use non-standard evaluation in our table. And that's important. Um, um, and we believe that it has some advantages, um, or a few adva many advantages. So if you do that, what you will see, so our table doesn't know a one-dimensional table like here. So it always goes into the rows. So it's essentially, if you make, um, yeah, um, always goes into the row. The second thing, if you have two arguments, um, you get a table object with a two dimension, like with, with columns and rows, um, a 2D table. Um, but other than that, pretty much the same. What's to expect it? What's to be expected? You see here, because often in clinical trials, um, there is an N equal, xx, um, the number of patients in that arm. Um, so that's shown by default. If you look at the Q table, um, if you look at the Q table function documentation, there should be a argument show call counts. So if you make this equal false, um, it should not oh, show, boy. hopefully, otherwise yep, um, there you it's, go. A, it's a brand new feature. Yeah. Um, Yes, so I, th I think this, it will be, you can run those pieces of code as we talk and then ask if you have issues. Is anyone running the code? Um, and maybe that's a, that's a poll um, question. If Rachel, if you could write the poll, who's running the code or so that I know how long to wait um, until somebody maybe ask a question. So we intend to walk through it. You can walk with, with us and execute the code and look. Um, and the, and modify. Why don't we go through the rest of the slides about Qtable yeah. while we're waiting for that? Yes. Um, and then and we then can, can 
can go we can give to people it. time for to, to run all of the code for mm -hmm. Qtable if they if they want to do that. Good. And so I think the main difference, as I mentioned already, is um, oh. The main difference is um, the first argument is always a data frame. The second argument, interesting, um, is is um, as the second difference. It's always a two-dimensional table, and by default we show the n equal x x this this row here in the header in the columns. Good. Um, so it's brand new. We, we've 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 designed it for this um, for this workshop. Um, and it's primarily intended for exploratory data analysis. I think it's more interesting for biostats and maybe um, statistical program or quick have to ask a question. If if your job is um, writing production table that gets sent to the health authority or ends up in any reporting pipeline, probably don't want to use Qtable. You probably want to learn the larger framework that we're going to discuss in um, detail um, in this in this workshop. Um, and I think this is still me, yes. And so one thing, so and so this is essentially the equivalent of table to Q table, but because our table is a is a much more flexible framework for table generation, there were a couple of quick wins that we got. One is you can give a vector of variable names, and then you have essentially faceted frequency table, meaning you say, I would like to split in the row space by country by the levels of country and gender and in the column space by arm and you get this table um essentially that's the frequency table and this is as deep as you want so you can add you can keep adding more variables here you can keep adding more variables in the column space um, um, so it's fully general when you do that it's just the table gets bigger and bigger and less readable, um, but yes. So um, that's one of the, I think, one of the things that table won't provide you that you get fairly easily as an extension of of using Q table instead of table. Um, the next extension we have, um, which you don't get from table, there are other like aggregate and other functions. Or I think if you're in the deep layer space, you can group by in summary. Um, is you can say, well, I actually don't want a frequency count. I would like to you analyze the variable age, and I would get like to get the mean um, of the variable age for each group. So females from China um, in our May, a, uh, in our A, not um, or male USA, um, RMB. Um, so you can essentially say for all the all the all the all the subjects that there are. Um, that are in this cell or associated to this cell here, I would like to get the average age. And you see that actually shows up here. Um, and just to show you that that works um, here, um, if you run this, that's the table. It's all fairly quick. Um, that's how it reads. And then maybe two things. Um, there, there is some labeling that we do automatically. So the, um, age and mean show up here. So you know it's not a frequency um, table. Um, and then maybe the last, and so it's all general, not you can nest as, as much as you want, but I think the tables get less and less readable. So we removed some nesting here. We do, so, but we do essentially say, well, we would like to analyze. Um, so five num is a function in R, it returns a vector with five values, which is minimum first quantile, median third quantile, and maximum of the values. Um, and so here we wrote the function um, to label those uh, because this just re returns a vanilla vector. Um, you can give a function that returns a list um, and each, each ele named element in the list becomes a row. Um, um, and so that's another convenience function, even like if you look in demographic tables, not um, if you want to have mean standard deviation and range and so on. Um, that's a very powerful feature here in Qtable. Um, that's how it would look like. So I'm quick executing that here to show how that works. So five num, maybe if you look at five num, anything now it's like five num of any 
any numeric variable one to ten, not um, we get this. Um, so five num five num two, and so maybe the reason you, we we did we did um, we we wrote that um, function here is we need we need those labels that then show up in the row names um, because the five num function itself, which is in ba which is in R, um, just gives a vector back, and so. Um, we also needed it to be a list. We need to be a list. That's true. Um, and so, do we do we have an example of multi multi valued cell in the slides? I think not. Later we have with count okay. percentage, but but yes, we can also have multi valued cells, which we show later. But um, there's a reason why it's a list and needs if to be. If you just want to do like copy line thirty nine and replace five num with range, they'll see why it has to be a list. So range, um, range takes in a numeric vector and it gives in a uh, out and an, um, a vector numeric vector. And so if you do that, it's not a list. You see, right. um, it only so makes we're not, a single cell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not generating multiple rows here. We're combining multiple values into a single cell for each um, for each sort of category, right? Um, so that is that's the reason. If you want to declare that it is going to be multiple cell, multiple rows, you want the function to return a list. So that's why we both converted it to a list and gave it the names, which are then used as the names of the rows. Yes. So there's an open question. We, after this Q table, things we address the question, and also um, the police. There's around 41% runs the code, so um, we give a minute or two time to ask if there's any question when you follow with running the code. But um, so the back to the five num not so it shows up as rows. Um, we do, I think, um, yeah. There, if you have NAs because there's no data associated to here, um, then you get NAs. Um, so that's. I think hopefully pretty much what you would expect. Maybe two things, so that, um, and maybe I go here into slideshow mode. There's a little bit of um, a little bit of slide transitions. So the first variable, um, the row splitting, um, you see them there, the labels, um, um, and then the five num gives you five rows per group. Um, so you see that. Um, in the second orange part, yeah. and and I think to wrap that part up um, about Q table, um, if you are using table often, then we hope we have given you an almost drop in replacement. You have to change a little bit, um, but from a from a complexity of using, I think the complexity is the same, but it provides you further downstream um, um, analytical capabilities like nesting, um, like analyzing multiple variables, like analyzing, like uh, analyzing the data with analysis functions instead of just counting. Um, you can do that with aggregate and, and deep layer summarize group, group by summarize, but um, our table gives you, I think, a fairly convenient way. It also does the rendering and so on in a, in a user-friendly way. Um, again, it, it, that looks, um, I think I'm quite happy that we added that. Um, it's not intended for statistical programmers. So the reason we added only now and not like three or four years ago is because our tables is intended to be a tool to make production ready tables um, that are fairly complex, that are in, in structure, much more complex than generalized nest across tables. Um, and we're going to show some of that. Um, and that's the third point. And I think with that, let's give it a, a minute pause. People can say if they have problems um, and we answer some of the questions. Um, so how do you export table as Excel P or PDF? Um, it's in the documentation of our table. Um, um, let me quick go back to the R table documentation. If you look 
in the reference, there is a function as PDF, as HTML, as PDF, as TSV, so there's to flex table, there's quite a few output things as functions. And so it's very well documented. Um, well, that's the wrong documentation. Um, as PDF, sorry, that was your question. So as PDF, so you can give you can give quite a few arguments to say what type font family, what's the font size, and so on. But it's also possible to do um, multiple multiple pages per PDF, um, and then with pagination, it's a very very flexible tool. Here is your um, code. No Excel export. Um, you can export it as. And you can export top. it as a CSV, which is yes, loadable CSV. in Excel. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I'm and going would... to answer, answer this here and then um, answer, type answer here. Uh, 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 one, I guess one and two um, export as CSV and import into Excel. Um, so the second, can we change? Yes. Um, uh, well, because... so it, so in the, in the core R tables framework, you absolutely can. You have full control over how things are rendered. In Q table, currently, no. Uh, but that could be added. But and again, Q table is intended for um, for like quick EDA, like similar to table. And so um, we just wanted something that's going to render nicely. Um, and so it infers how many decimal places you want. So if, if your function returns an integer object, it will not show any decimal places. But if it shows a numeric, it will do two. Um, that's just what we chose as the, as the default behavior that seemed reasonable. Um, we can look at adding more control to, to that, although Qtable is intended to be sort of really fast with pretty low complexity um which is why we you can't do things that you other other things that you can do in um in the core of our tables um so that's one thing um now beth atkinson asked about why um why there why do this when there are already packages that create summaries by group well for the first off we're not creating summaries by group or creating tables. Um, so these are fully fledged R tables objects and you that buys you a lot of things that those other things can't do. Um, many of them aren't gonna be super relevant to the sort of exploratory off the cuff um, tables such as this, but they could be. So for example, and we don't talk about this in the slide deck, but you know we can we can maybe cover it at the end. Um, and it's it's well documented elsewhere. But our tables implement implements what's called um, context preserving pagination, uh, which means that when you when you ask an R table to paginate itself, it understands which rows are summarizing group information and will repeat those after a page break so that when you read an individual analysis row, it will always have its context. It, we also support pagination in both vertical and horizontal directions simultaneously, which obviously is necessary because pages have both width and height. Um, so those are a couple of things. There's also, um, once you have one of these table objects, um, we support uh, a very robust way of selecting things from them called pathing. Um, this again is something that is not necessarily going to be hard to do for the types of tables that Qtable makes um, in these other systems, but some of the more complex tables um, would actually be quite difficult to to do and so basically this fits into a larger framework that existed already um and it gives you these capabilities and then it buys you all of the things 
all of the more powerful features um, that our tables has that other systems don't have for more complex tables. Yeah, so that's, I, that's I, I think I maybe a question we should have asked, and maybe let let me write to um, um, to Rachel. I assume most of the people here from clinical trial analysis, are, if there are people outside of clinical trial, like um, I think then their question becomes quite a bit more fair. We do though believe that's probably one of the most general table creation framework out there. Um, but in clinical trial, those tables sometimes really are not like a very weird tables. They're more like a report that have like the same columns um, um, or shared columns. And so, and then the formatting, the formatting um, like requirements and the way of dealing with those tables and the processing and so on, it really calls for a, a very flexible and um, essentially table generation framework. So that's, I think, the, the reason why we've created our tables. Good. I, I think in the chat or somewhere, if somebody can, where's the chat here? I also wonder how can I move this away here? Um, I don't know how to move it away. But in the chat, is there any, is is there anyone, has there anyone have an issue right now with running the code? Um, let us know. Otherwise, um, we move ahead with Gabe. Yeah. Good. Um, fabulous. Do you want to share, Gabe, or should I? Uh, yeah, I can, sh I can share. Good. Okay. Uh, is that the, do you guys see the slides? Yeah, okay. Yes. Is, yeah. All right. So we're down here. 28. 28. Got it. All right. So let's switch um, So that was Qtable. Qtable is very new. We think it's a nice utility, but it's not the core of what Rtables is, right? So that's the other answer to the question. We didn't create the Rtables package in order to create um, Qtable. Qtable is just a utility function that we've written pretty late in Rtables lifetime because it seems nice if you're already in the table framework because you need to do something that those other table frameworks can't easily do. So now let's talk about what uh, the sort of normal traditional R tables framework looks like. Oh, that's sorry, that's still a Q tables. Uh, so the normal R tables layouting framework goes like this: you create a layout which declares the structure of um, the table, and then you apply that layout to data, which will then construct an actual table object. So here we have a very simple example that's uh, similar to what we just did. Um, it's the same table, in fact. Um, so we've got our five num two again, but here, instead of calling Q table, we're gonna call basic table, which says I'm starting a table, right? And you can, we're not doing so here, but you can say the, the title of the table, footer materials and stuff in, in basic table. And then we're gonna say, okay, for the arm, I wanna split the columns by arm. So splitting is faceting. So I want faceting in the in what would be the X axis in a ggplot to be arm. And then I want faceting um, in the what, what would be the Y axis to be sex. And then I want to analyze, like within those facets, facet panes, I want to analyze age with this function. And here you can see, we're, we use the same format, but here we actually do have control over the format with that format option. So we could we could make that one uh, decimal point, we could make that three decimal points, uh, et cetera. Um, so just to sort of be explicit, uh, split calls declares the column faceting right here. So the rows declares the row faceting, which is just the F and the M, the sections. And then to get the actual rows, we say analyze. Um, and then once we have our layout, we, I don't, I don't have a slide to highlight that, but we call build table, 
and we give the layout and the data and it constructs the table for us. Now it's important to note and well actually let's just go ahead. Uh, so now let's dig into exactly what's going on there. Um, so a lot of people sort of view the first step in constructing a table to be calculating the cell values. That's a very traditional approach that um, that other table engines will take. That is not the approach that our tables takes. And we can we saw that even in that one small example, we were not calling five num on anything to get a data frame that had those values in it and then rearranging them to make a table, right? We said, this is the structure of my table within the pane, the facet panes, I want five num like those five numbers that come out of there to be rows and then it it calculated it itself um so that's a that's a large difference um and the reason that we're doing that is because most people don't think of them this way but tables are actually like tables of the type that we're talking about here like the sort of clinical trial reporting tables are faceted data visualizations and so here we have a sort of ggplot and with some nested faceting here. And then we have an equivalent uh, table that was generated in our tables. Um, and we can see that each component in each one of these sides has an exact analog on the other side, right? So we have, you know, the, the subplots are, you know, these sections, um, which is equivalent to what was coming out of 5num in our previous example, you know, the individual bars this is a bar with zero but it's still technically there's a bar there um are the um are the cells right here um rows are actually cut across subplots right columns um include the the whole subplot um and so yeah so th this is the way that our tables thinks about tables um, and it ends up being extremely powerful and it lets us do a lot of really cool stuff with a sort of really succinct set of verbs that are, you know, they're very akin to the types of some of the types of verbs that you would do use in more traditional visualization. Um, so, um, so just just to sort of nail this point home, imagine if you're creating a faceted, um, you know, a complex faceted ggplot visualization, you would never calculate all the values by hand yourself first and then pass that to ggplot. Like ggplot does all the subsetting for the facets for you. It applies its geomes in order to construct the visual elements. It applies its stats to, to construct the numerical values that are then like inform the, the visual elements. Like ggplot is what does that. You don't do that yourself. That's the same in our tables. Our tables is going to act like ggplot much more than it's going to act like dplyr plus gt. And that is a very intentional choice that we made um, which we think gives a lot of power and a lot of expressivity to the to our tables. So, yeah. So you don't want to you don't want to do that because, like, it's tedious and error prone, and computers are good at that stuff, and humans are bad at it. So, let the computers do the stuff that they're good at. Like I I like to call that the zeroth law of computing. Um. So is this you, Adrian? I don't recall. Yes, yes that's that's me. I I can take over from here. If you can stop the screen. So actually, share. so first, are there any questions about this link between tables and visualizations that I just talked about? We will get into more of it uh, in a bit, but if you have any questions now, um, I can address those while we are switching. Um, so Adrian, you can go ahead and. Um, mm -hmm that um doesn't look like there's any super immediate questions so go ahead and uh just type the question in the chat if you do have one or in the in the q a i, I meant um good um so i think 
every time you get lost in our tables, <laughs> visualize this, this image to kind of get an understanding in which phase of table creation um, or of, of the of the journey of creating a table you are. Um, it's um, it's it's for, it's it, it, you can separate it in four pieces. So one is you define a layout. The layout um, describes the faceting. It does describes the analysis, the cell value derivation, and it has formatting instructions. And in the early days of our table, we tried to split that up. We found that not to be to the point. It just got, over, I think, overly complicated. So that's what we found to be a good way of grouping those, I think, those pieces together. Then you take a data frame. And, and the idea is that our, that our table is very powerful in cell value derivation and um, adding like total col columns. Now we don't, optimally, you don't have to do any pre-processing of the data frame. Like you don't derive any cell values. You don't stack the data set to get the total column. That's all, all that's all layouting part. Um, and then it take the data set and the layout, which creates an R table object, which somebody asked about R table object. That's a that's a tree structure um, implemented um, with S4. Um, you, so I think it's general to say nobody who uses R table ever has to go and understand that that object from a S4 design point of the way we've designed it. We've provided a lot of tooling around that. Um, so we um, we expect from a user to understand how to work with that object as a as an object with the different access and modifier functions. And anyway, and then you can take that object and you can export it to a formatted um, output that can be printed or used in a web page and so on. And so we have ASCII, we have PDF, we have RTF, we have HTML. I think there's LaTeX. Um, yeah. Um, there's lots of formats. And so I'm now going to show that again in a couple of different ways. Um, and then we go further into the details of layouting and in, into the table creation and then into working with those objects. So you define a layout, you take a data set, you call build table with first argument layout, the second of it's a data frame, and that gives you an R table object. Um, if you make print, you get a format. If you run print on that R table object, it gives you a formatted table in ASCII. So print is what you've seen before when I when I ran that stuff in R Studio. Um, I think that's also one nice difference between our tables and other table frameworks is that our lowest, uh, our most general um, visualization of a table is ASCII, which makes it very, very um, good for interactive analysis on the command line, where others, I think, start with HTML, um, which means you have to be on something that can render HTML. Um, and it's in a different pane, it's not in the, it's in the editor and command, like in the console, uh, you need something more. Um, Yes, so let's, oh, sorry. Yes, so let's look at that um, in in its essentially most simplest format. You say library R tables, you create the basic table. Basic table has lots of arguments, um, but you can give it no argument. We use the new R pipe. Lots of you know the, the probably the Magritte percent, um, greater percent um, pipe. Um, we prefer this one. Um, it's part but of the they, R base. They both work. They both work, yeah. Um, you, you call split calls and you say, well, I would like to split, I would like to create columns for every level of ARM. And by that time, it doesn't know what ARM is. Not the only place where ARM actually exists as a variable is in X ADSL. And that's important. Not you declare you declare a table, it can be complete bogus, we only check certain things as you create the layout. Um, um, it, but it will fail, fail in the build if, if it doesn't, if those constraints given in the layout are not met, it will fail with build table. And, and then you will, say, 
Yeah. So it, was, it, it will fail with an informative message that tells you that your variable didn't exist. It's not. It's, so like, it will tell you what happened. Yes. And so the next step would then be, so if basic table has um, one column, one row, and the cell represents all 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 subjects um, or the entire data set. Um, then you split. You create a column for each arm level. You analyze the variable age, um, and you want to get the mean. Um, and the format of the cell uh, rendering should be um, two comma places. Um, that object you can go and inspect, and then you can make build table, give it a data frame, and print that. And so I'm going to go through this. Um, in in the um, so in what the, so while while you're doing that, um, there's a question um, which I um, am a little, so I'm assuming that by output types this means like output formats like PDF or HTML or things like that. Um, if not, please re-ask the question um, with with what you were what you were actually trying to understand. But um, the answer is it depends. Some some of them our tables generates itself. So PDF is a is a native renderer that our tables has. Um, some of the others. Um, do go like we translate into another table type in order to make use of their output capabilities. That's how we support RTF. Um, uh, but HTML and ASCII and PDF currently are native, but it shouldn't um, it shouldn't matter too much because you know it's still our table's job to make sure that the output looks the way that it's going to, that you want it to look. So, um, so yeah, I think that answers that question, but uh, if not, please, please do answer it again. Good. So I'm going to show now that code step-by-step step and I'll show you how like, um, you can follow me, um, but so you can run each of those aggregated, so you can basic table gives you predated table layout and the predator is important. Um, so you can do this not then you know not split column structure uses arm by levels. You can do this. Now we know we split by arm and by levels. You can keep adding split rows. Um, and then you can do the analyze not um, and so now we know in the end we analyze age with a certain function that's not part of the layout. But so you can create those layouts. Um, you can inspect those layouts. Um, you can then build the table with with a, with with a data frame and the layout, and you get the actual table. Now, if if those constraints by the layout are not met, like for example, if you give it the iris data set, then it essentially says a verbal arm not found not. And I think one way of using layouts, and so there's multiple way of thinking about it, you can create functions that create layout, or you can actually store layouts and then reuse them, for, for example, for different subsets of the data set not. I can essentially take this and say, well, I'm actually interested in this um, where all, um, let me see, um, I take a numeric. Oh, all patients are greater than 80, 80 not so. Um, library dplyr. Um, um, and so you can subset this on the fly. Let me make subset um, ADSL. You can say this is equal to x ADSL um, with filter um, h greater 22 or 18 not if you do that um this will have um dimension will have 400 um you need it to be higher i think they're all greater than 18. And they're all, they're all 18 yeah that's what i just bought so let's say they're older than 45 um let's see that again so we have 400 and yes yeah, so now we have 35 you run build table on this 
um, we use exactly the same layout and you get lots of missing, but um, you get the same table for the subset. Um, yeah. Do you want to just quickly turn on the column counts so they can see? It's, yes, a, um, it's an argument of basic table. Show call counts equals true. So then if we scroll up, we can see these are going to add up to 400. But now when you do it, now remember this layout is the exact same layout. We're just using different data. So now if you do the second build table um, on line 54. It, yes, yes. Um, and you scroll up. See now, now these add up to whatever it was, 33 or something, right? So... Once you yeah. have your layout, you can apply you can apply it to any data set that that meets the sort of implicit specification. Yes. Um, and then, there's a, go ahead. Yeah. there's a question. We answer that later in the formatting part. Um, yeah, we have we discussed the formatting, well, so we we'll make sure to answer that then. I'll move forward. Or do you have something more, Gabe? To yeah, no, that's yeah, agreed. Okay, so um, so let's look at that. In, in an animation again, um, the table here is the table object in our in our cartoon or in our, I guess, um, um, drawing. Um, then the layout is this LYT we created with those functions here. Um, and then when you, this is the data frame EX ADSL. And um, when we print the table, we get uh, the ASCII characters, the essentially the render table as ASCII. Um, and so there's really a big difference between the output of this. This is a string not printed. This is a tree structure. So we, we keep all the information of the, there's lots and lots of information in that object down to the unrounded numbers of the cell values. Um, um, there's pathing information that you can use downstream for lots of different use cases. So um, I think that's important to consider that this is really something different than this. Um, like the table object is different than the printer table. And I think that's fine. We've seen that. Um, I think that, go, that I'll pass the ball to Gabe. Yep. Um, yep. Uh, let me just start to share. Where did you go? Did I? Um, yeah, there you are. Gotcha. All right. Um, so, so I get to the. 39. I'm in slide mode, so. So, layout. so now we're going to talk about how these layouts are constructed in a little bit more detail. Um, so as we mentioned, layouts are free data declarations of table structure, which means that they essentially rely on an implicit data specification in terms of the variables being present in whatever data you want to apply them to, but they don't actually access the, the data right when you're constructing the layout the typical way to do that does not require the data to be in place it only requires you to know what variables will be in the data and it starts with basic table as we saw so there are a small number of layouting verbs that when combined can create all of the tables that are supported by our tables right um so First, uh, we have a set of verbs that declare faceting. So these are going to declare the structure um, in both row and column space, right? So we see you've seen split rows by and split calls by. Um, you can also split by cuts of continuous variables. You can also split where each of the facets represents a different variable. That's what the split by multivar does. So there, if you have a table where each of the columns is, you know, a different value, um, that's one of the ways that you can do that. Um, and you can also, we're not going to talk about it a ton here, but you can actually fully customize the splitting behavior. Um, 
and we have some, some links to some advanced training where we discuss that in more detail, but you have full control over the fastening process. Um, but you often won't need to use that control. Um, and by default, each of these, if you, if you do it more than once, if you do split, split rows by country and then split rows by um, sex underneath that, that would nest the, the gender splitting inside each country. So you'd have, you know, as we saw in Q table. Um, so you'd have, you know, China, male, female, undisclosed or undifferentiated. Um, and then, you know, Great Britain, male, female, et cetera. Um, next, we have uh, cell value derivation. Um, this is, um, this, these are what we call the analyze verbs. So these are what are going to generate the actual um, sort of basic rows of your table. Um, there's two flavors of this. There's analyze, which um, takes a function, and then that function is going to receive the data associated with the facet, uh, facet pane that's in both the row faceting and column faceting. And then analyze call vars, which is basically the way that you analyze when you've done split calls by multivar so that it it knows which um, it expects you to give it multiple functions one for each of the columns and then it will pass down the data from the variable that's associated with that column into your into the function um, and then finally we have um, sort of marginal or group summarization. We have this only currently in row space, but you can generate summary rows, which summarize entire facets, regardless of how many. And these can happen at any point in the nesting process. Um, and so those are summarized. Um, and then Adrian, am I doing this or are you doing this? I, I'm doing this. Um, okay. it's, it's, it's a bit heavy on my part at the beginning, but then Gabe will do the rest um, yeah. in the end part. So, so are there any any questions on that while we switch sharing? Doesn't look like it, so. This will stop, um, continue, good. Oh, I haven't chat yet, good. So. There it is. Um, can you see my screen analysis? Yep. yep. Good. Yes, that seems to work. Good. So, and I think one important, I think we've mentioned a couple of times, but I will, I will call it out explicitly. We believe one of the core functionality of our table is the derivation of cell values. Um, and that is a little bit con like that other frameworks use start with data frames. And then if you start with the data frames, you have a very good tool to derive a data frame, which mainly is the plier these days, I think is accepted as the, um, the most useful tool to derive data frame um, on large probably, um, or at least considered by the community. We did. We on purpose didn't choose to go that way because if you build fairly complex tables from clinical trials, like using clinical trials with the plier, it becomes very, very complex um, to do that. There's like duplicated data. You have to take account of certain things and then you have to remove it again. Um, that's not the case with our tables, and that's why so much work and and and. And on the surface complexity not goes into define, defining the R tables framework. But I think if you get more used to using R tables and understanding how we think about the cell value derivation part, which includes the splitting and analysis function um, definition, I hope um, you will agree with us that um, it, it is a useful addition to, yeah. Or it's a useful direction other than using the plier and creating data frames. Um, good. So, and we can talk some more at the end about that if somebody would like to discuss that. But, but so, I've mentioned, I've, I've briefly touched on that before. When you when you say basic table and you don't add a split and call and split rows. 
it's essentially a table where all the all the all the patients as objects are associated to the column and all the patients are associated to the row so it's the column um, and then so if you need what you create the row with analyze so if all the patients are associated to the column you create one row where you analyze h by default analyze takes mean um, and so that would be the table um, now if you want to reply re return multiple values you don't have to call analyze in, in sequence, I mean, could you could you could run analyze four times and say count and or length and um, or sum is not like the sum of the observations that's not missing. Um, you could run analyze for this and this, but you can also because it's in the same splitting um, world, you can or environment you can um, essentially use that in rows functions and give it what rows would you like to have per cell so the cell here is gen in a generalized splitting way so all observation um and then and then here because we don't split rows by it's also all observation here um and so you can have multiple rows returned um so, so one I'm one very brief thing um here so like just remember that uh, the the multiple rows return thing that adrian was just talking about that's the same, exactly the same, in fact, as a faceted bar plot having more than one bar in each subplot, right? So that's what's going on, uh, and that should hopefully help that make sense. So you run that um, build table, you get this, um, um, and here in rows, so if you look in turn, and that's why we used a fund, it's an analysis function. And so in analysis function, we mix formatting and um, and derivation analysis. Um, you, you can also say, well, I only want to do the statistical part and I do the formatting later. You can split that into analysis part and, and formatting, formatted analysis. Here we do it in one step. Um, so in rows n is equal sum of non-missing um, of whatever comes in. It's a vector here, assumed. Um, yeah, and so you can give it formats um, here. So it's an argument to in rows, and it, the format for n is essentially xx. Format for mean standard deviation is this. One round, you could also add another one with xx with x. Um, and we talk about that later. Median is this. So this is essentially your, your um, function. And so now, if you, I mean, we keep using the five now because it's a nice, nice example. Um, it's a simple, nice example. If you run that with any number, any any vector, not you get that back. Not it says how does the format cell look? Um, this we haven't yet discussed. This we have also not discussed. Um, but what's the name? What's the format? Yeah, what's the cell? Not um, very briefly. We distinguish between name for pathing and what's printed. Um, that is useful if you followed CDISC standards, but you need to change the label for some reason. The pathing into the elements to access the actual n of the of the table object stays the same. Um, I think that's a little bit advanced here. We don't have to go much deeper into that. Um, and if you run that, you get this. Um, and so, um, I think we keep it with that with analysis derivation. There's lots to be said about analysis um, for the workshop. I think we made, yeah. I think the most things important things have been covered. There is a summarized row group. We showed that a little bit later. And Gabe shows that. Um, in rows, if you want to have multiple rows per analysis call, um, um, you can also run um, analysis sequentially um, to create more rows. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Um, so I guess we'll go ahead and um, there was a question in the chat. I was hoping that that um, it was going to get added to the Q and A, but it didn't. But um, the answer is yes. Um, so by so what's happening in our tables um there you go 
Uh, thank you, Caitlin. So, um, so what's happening in our tables, as we've talked about, like the actual object is, is like a structured object. And so there's a sub table or age that has at, at each at each level of the of the tree where that's being analyzed. And by default, if you only analyze one variable, because you can analyze more than one, but if you only analyze one variable, it doesn't display what variable it is. Um, but there are a couple of different ways. Um, one is um, show labels equals top left. Um, so do you want to run that quick? Yeah, yeah, I'm doing it right now. I just want to click show here. Show labels. Uh, it's actually, I think it's var. What's this show labels? Okay, yeah. Okay, the variable labels. Oh, a moment. You scroll up, scroll up. Var labels. Rest top left. So top left is a, is a no. So top left is a is a um, value of show labels. So if you just type top left in there, that should work uh, with an underscore. Default visible hidden. No, it's not this one. Oh, I see. Okay, so in that case, um, I can make visible here. But I yeah, think so you can top, make visible. There's and a then, top left somewhere. <laughs> which yeah. So then that does that, um, and then. Maybe that's, oh, yeah. So I think um, the I think top left is for the splitting. So yeah, it'll, splitting. It, will, it will build up the skeleton as you split. I think um, in basic table, it has a top left knot. Yeah, you can specify, you can also specify it. Um, you can specify top left is age there. Um, I will change that. I think that, um, you should be able to do that. But right now, yeah, you would add it there. But um, where's the top left not? here? Oh, no. So it's it's append. It's append. It's append. I think it's a function. Not like you would yeah, do this. It's um, append, append top left. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was and looking. I, was, I wasn't aware that uh, age. Yeah. yeah. I, I, yeah. And then and then age goes up there. Um, and you, you remember that the. Um, Q table does that for you automatically. Um, and it, it does that using this mechanism. But um, yeah, that's just an over. So, so um, Adrian, since while we're in there, can you find one that has a couple of levels of row nesting and do the labels equals top left to show them what I'm talking about there? Yes, I make split rows, split, split rows um, by. Um, and then here there's an argument called um label position. label pause yeah what does it say here the documentation top left <laughs> yeah and then we so let's do that um well and then if you go up it will show you there and then you yeah you also have age because you're appending that still but then if you do um like arm? another one yeah armor country or it doesn't really matter uh, i mean it's a little um, bit silly here this analysis but 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 um so then if you go up then you can see sex arm and like it's actually doing a little indenting thing for you so you can build up you have the option to build up the sort of skeleton because um because again, like so, like the levels, like F and M, are levels of sex, but they're not labeled as such. So you can have that label go up in the top left there. Um, yeah. So it looks like you currently can't do that for analyze, but we can we can add that as well, and then you'll be able to do that in a future version. Good. I hope that was a long, <laughs> long thing for my answer to the yeah. question. Is good. So format labels. So we have, I believe we introduced that concept. Um, and if you do that, we yet have not found the, the regular expression to generalize it because we're not completely sure yet what's the best generalization. Um, um, we got some pull requests. We have declined them because they were not general enough for us. Um, so right now to to use those format labels, we just keep adding them as people request them. And that's what we currently have. 
Well, there are a couple of, so there's a couple of escape valves as well. So these are the most fully featured things and they are the ones that are most useful and a thing that you're going to see in a second that Adrian's going to show you. But to answer the specific question, you can specify any function that will return a single scalar string and our tables will use that as a formatter. You can also specify formats in the form of like the C printf um, specification. Um, so you do you do have full control. It's just that some of the features, like the one that Adrian's about to show you, um, will sort of have limited utility if you're if you're specifying functions instead of uh, labels. But you can you can do it. You can fully control how they're rendered. You can fully control, but if you leave the format labels realm. You make your life more difficult. So we we if you don't have to, probably don't do it. But if you need to, there's multiple ways of doing it. So essentially, it's possible to run a linear regression, save that object into each cell, and then write a formatting instruction that goes and gets out values from the fit object. Um, it's all possible. Um, if you want to do that, that's not a question. Um, but so one of the nice things um, then, and so and so actually you can test that not like you can you can write R cell um, and you can say, well, I want 1.1234 not, and I want format is equal xx. It's like that. You can say, well, I want format dot x not. Um, you can then do this. You can give it a vector number, you can make something two-dimensional, like um two point. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Not um, now. The format has to be something else. So the format has to be from here. So you can use, for example, any of those here. Let's use this one here. Um, so should be fairly accessible to learn about the format labels. Also, the other parts are um, if you go and look in the documentation of R cell. Um, um, R cell, and what Gabe has mentioned, should be format, and format is a character, the format string format. Oh, it's not documented here. No, it is. Or a formatter function. It says right there. Where's, this, where's the sprintf function? There's also an s. Oh, so the sprintf function is we provide a constructor which produces a formatting function okay, yeah. from an sprintf. Um, yeah. Spec. So, so okay. that, that we can we can make that more clear. But make, but that's clear, yes. what's happening. Like you, yes. so if you do, um, what is it? Format S print F something like yeah. that. It's fine. We will make that more clear. Yeah, it's format S print F. I probably will make it. Uh, I probably make a mistake if I do it. But it, I think it's in format. Does I mean? Yeah. So that that's yeah. another thing. All yeah. of this stuff is actually available to other packages. All of the actual formatting machinery, we we pulled it out and put it in formatters. And so that's where our tables gets all of its sort of value to string rendering, but other mm -hmm. other packages could also use that as well if they wanted to. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to skip that, but it's possible. It's all in the documentation, I think, in the vignettes. Um, now, if you have a table and if you use the format format labels, you can run table shell on that table and it gives you essentially well, except for the bug that we have currently with the n equal, the no, it still keeps the numbers. So we're going to make that also fix that, but um, it gives you essentially a, a table shell and table shells are useful for planning. They're useful for defining standards. Um, I think for internal communication, those are very useful. So um, that's a, nice little feature that that might be useful in your environment so essentially what it does not it just prints the it prints the structure but not the numbers the values it just prints the the label um the format labels instead and the last part about analysis the two last things about analysis value analysis function sorry is that a fair, that's a fairly sophisticated topic like 
we provide many arguments if you request them in the in the analysis function. So you can ask like how many how many subjects are associated to the column that you are in, how many subjects are total in the data frame. We provide a split context, which is even yet more advanced. And I think there's even there's a point, it's a very advanced topic, what you can find in a split context, because you can split in columns, you can split in rows to get to the subset of data that's relevant for you. Um, and you can also ask what is actually the variable that you, that like if you say um, analyze age, not if you need the information that you analyze age, you can ask for the variable. Um, so that documentation is a fairly long piece of text to read. Um, and as you get become an advanced R table programmer, you probably spend some time in that documentation. And so I wrap that discussion up with how do you make a count percentage um, analysis function? And so essentially what you do is you create the function, the first argument is X, that's the that's whatever vector that's got sent. Um, the second variable is those special variable names that we set that, that are conditionally provided if you ask for them. And so then you can say, well, sum of is not, not missing times one over n call. Um, if you do that, um, you can then use that function in here. Here we give the R cell with the format, so you don't have to specify any formats here. Um, and you write build table, let's run that, and then we are back to fast setting. Um, Yes, so that's good. Um, so here, if you run this, um, if you run this function, not um, hundred, and let's say we have two hundred, not we will get something like this. Um, and if you use that in the layout, that's what you get. Not um, so. Um, that's essentially how you have control over your formatting um, and multi-valued cells. Um, yeah. Good, Gabe, I'll pass the ball to you. Yeah. Okay, so Stephen has a fairly advanced question here i think we will address that now we will end. address that i think but, at the end i think that might become more um clear when you see the fast setting and data structure part yeah so uh declaring facets we talked a little bit about this already um but just to be completely clear you'd split rows by and split columns by and there are some other options for each of them as well um these are essentially going to be independent in the same way that what you put in the rows and columns arguments of facet grid are, are independent and they sort of they're independent because they're defining the different axes essentially and then they come together to define the facet panes um so we're just going to go through some examples and really sort of hammer in the point that this really is just exactly the same as what you probably have already seen in ggplot um, and that is a useful way of thinking about that here, right? So we're saying facet columns by arm, and then give me a box plot, or facet the columns by arm, and then give me the range, right? So these are going to be the same, like you can see the same structure here. For rows, we have, again, facet grid rows, and then we have split rows by, and these are doing the same thing um and then you have grid which is when you specify both rows and columns and again you have um you have a split calls by and a split rows by um and that's equivalent to these you know columns and rows here um and then i don't have the code for this but we do have it i believe in the uh supplementary materials there just wasn't really room um but you can have nested faceting, right? So here we have nested faceting in the column space where we first facet by arm and then within each arm, we facet by uh, sex. Um, and then, so you can do that in ggplot and it just sort of, it does, it repeats the, the labels 
which is fine. We don't um, repeat the top labels, right? The we just center them. So like the A drug X is just once and then it applies to everything that's underneath it, um, which is a more traditional sort of table rendering structure for that for that type of information. But it's it's equivalent to just, you know, on the left there, you've got A, F, and then A, M, right? Um, so, oh, so here's the, here's the example that we, we just needed a separate slide for it there. So there's the code with the, um, with the example for that. Um, and then, um, am I doing group summaries? Cause I, I feel like you were doing group uh, summaries. I, I, and do, then, I do, I do the group yeah. summaries and then, um, so one second, looks like there's so. Oh, should I go? Should I continue? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, was, I was answering uh, so the nest yeah, yeah. is pretty studio. Did you discuss the nest split? Uh, yeah, it's right here. Oh, yeah, good. That's, That's, yeah, we've got that. So, oh, so one, one thing I guess I will say is like the one difference um, between the sort of traditional layout R tables framework and, um, and ggplot is you can see that they're separate split rows calls right we split rows by r by sex and then after that we split rows by bh b1 hl which is this like made up high or low for your biomarker variable that we define up above um and the reason for that is what you're about to hear from adrian so there is a reason that we don't just say split rows by and then give a vector and that is what you're about to hear Yes, so I have a couple of slides, and then I think we can make a short bio break, and then we go yep. to uh, the longer. That's good. More, so those are all fairly fundamental topics. Then we get a little bit more advanced in the yep. second. Uh, um, yes. So, um, so, so in our tables, we have a concept of group summaries, um, and those group summaries are very general but also like relevant in the um like if you look for example at the adverse events table not when you say well in that group like um like in that a body system class not i would like to have all patients that are all subject of at least one adverse event that's that's considered a summary um and that gets repeated it's, that provides context to whatever follows that like if we then analyze um the different type of adverse events, not um, that at least one adverse event is, is context. And so I'm going to show a little bit how that looks here. Um, it has implications of pagination when you split up the table into printable um, printable sections for, for let's say, put printing on a page or PDF. Um, um, those usually get, if you want, repeated. Um, but so here, no group summaries. Um, that essentially looks like this. Um, it gives you a table when you run this. It gives you a table with only the the um, with all the labels. Not it gives you the labels. There's nothing in those circles. It prints essentially the blue cells. So what 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 is to be expected here for every level of those? You get a cell uh, um, Cartesian product, I guess, um, and it's possible, as mentioned before, that actually you can return multiple rows for this, um, for this, for these blue things, for this blue, um, because this this is really a facet. It's a subset. For this facet, you can make multiple rows, return multiple rows, um, and so three levels of group summaries. Um, it's yes, the root. The root, the root, then, the root yeah. is added, and then the um, sex and B A B one H L uh, biomarker low high um, in this um, case. And so what we've also sneaked in here in that picture is you see the tree now. Not there's a root, then you you split by arms, and the arms have level. Um, there's a root in the row space. You split by sex, and each there's levels for this variable. And then for each level of, like for each gender, we split again. Um, 
by this variable, which actually we didn't write here, and then they have high and low. So on this path here would be high low. Um, and then we analyze H, and then that gives you the row, gives us the row B. And so that's then pathing that we expect, like you have those things accessible, which is quite useful if you are in the CDISC standard, if you're in any sort of standardized table um, world, you, those paths become very meaningful to actually access the value and make cross-checking. But for here, we only look at group summaries. So if you run this, by default, you get those, those um, cells back um, or rows. Um, if you add after the first split call by, uh, if you add before the first split rows by, uh, summarize row groups, you will get those cells here. So you still get the blue, but like the, the, the squares, but now we have added this. And by default, it makes a count percentage um, analysis. So essentially, it says for all the data in the rows, like for all the data, then split by A, B, and C. Now it's like for essentially all the patients or subjects in arm A, um, tell me how many are missing and um, um, and the percentage of all the patients in here um, are. Um, if you add the second on the off, like before BHL or after gender, it says essentially for, for all sex females, that's how many we have, the percentage um, within here, the top level, which is the root. So it's the same as arm um, and so on. So for male, and then if you put it in the end, um, you get it in the lower point, um, you get those summaries and by default, it makes count percentage. But where you put those summarized row groups really matters in your splitting instructions. Um, um, so you can add a lot of group summaries um, when you do that. And I think if, if we do that again, analyze create, creates um, the, the most specific facet analysis, not it can be multiple rows and group summaries summarize marginal facets here. Um, um, there's many of them, the more you split. Um, anything to add here, Gabe? What was that? Uh, yeah, so the, um, and the other thing to keep in mind, which you alluded to very slightly, um, is those circles can actually have multiple rows in them if you want it to as well. There are at least some production tables that are in the TLG catalog where the summary is something along the lines of number of patients that had at least one adverse events in this class and then the total number of events in the class. And that's two rows. Um, and those two rows together make up this group summary, right? And so those two rows together will be repeated after pagination because together they're providing the context. So all of the shapes here are going to default to being a single, having a single row in them, but they can all have multiple rows in them if you want to. Okay. Um, well, yes. Good. Um, and for right now, that is one of the reason why we can't transpose our tables. So you can't take a table object and say T parenthesis, and then you, it, arm shows up on the rows and the roots. That's some other reason as well. That's a design decision we made early on. Um, I think by now, like having been a couple of years in it, I think we have now generalizations that we could think about enabling it, but I'm not so sure if that's the future, a feature that we had anytime soon. Yes. But the the flip side of that is that because this framework is so general and powerful, you can't have an existing object and then transpose it. But most tables, you can just directly construct either what would be the transpose of it or something very, very similar that has the same information in it. So you can still get those those structures that are sort of transposes of something else. You just have to lay them out and build them directly rather than going from an existing object. Yes. And that's, yeah, so 
And so interestingly, that table we've just built here, <laughs> um, if we show all the group summaries, is very little, um, is, is very simple to create. Um, um, now I'm going to spend a couple of minutes walking through that table just to show you how that table would actually look like. Um, yes, it splits group summaries. So here's our example ADSL. And by the way, if you look at this, um, and if you use Studio, there's that button here, um, all the titles that have those four dashes in the end will show up here. So we are in the group summaries part. Um, so if we create example ADSL, um, we create the basic, it looks like this. Um, B is just the, the, the row that we create. Um, and then I think I don't do all the steps. Actually, I don't do none. I don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah, I only yeah, do the last one. If we do the full, if we show all row summaries, the default wall, it gets a big table. Um, and so, um, I guess. Yeah. Well, it's not longer, it's just denser. There's a bunch it's more. It's, it's denser. It. And so to understand what relates to what, we hope it's kind of clear. It's clear. I think usually you would not show the summary on every level, um, probably, except in like special adversary hands table and so on. Those then have, are probably different, not. It would say number or number of pages with at least one adverse event, total number of adverse events and so on. Um, yeah, so I and think- that, Well, so do the Q table, show them. The Q table, yes. Yeah, so just very Q, briefly, Q, you can Q turn table on- makes it, it makes it, makes yeah. it simple now. You can just say that that argument summarize groups, it summarizes all the groups. You don't have fine control over which level um, of splitting you want to summarize. Um, but yeah, I think that's another, um, I think, feature of Q table that you quick that, that you get. Yeah. So I suggest we make a five minute bio break and then we go to to slide 60, 76. Is that good? Yep, sounds good. Okay. Um, so we meet in 157 for is that good? Yep. Thank you very much.
good having Gabe in his 57. Okay, let's go ahead and get started again. I will share my screen. All right. So all right so now we're going to sort of step into a more advanced uh a more advanced sort of usage in of the conceptual framework uh and we're going to do this in reverse we're going to look at a table that is complicated and has multiple parts and we're going to walk through how to think about it like our tables thinks about it. And then we're going to talk about how that translates into how we would construct it in our tables. And so this is a table that's going to, it summarizes uh, a few different, you know, Cox proportional hazard models, right? It has an overall one and then it has um ones that are um by covariate um so the first thing that we notice is that this is this has two distinct top level sections right it has a um a section that's the sort of overall treatment and then it has a section that deals with the covariates and then for the covariates, that section has two subsections. It has the one that deals with the age covariate, and then that has the ones that deals with the race covariate, right? And then within those, it has a row, a single row in both cases that summarizes the overall covariate. And then it has effect um, summaries for each value of so for the median of age because age is um age is numeric but then for each of the levels of race okay so um and finally the columns are going to reflect different elements of the same model fit right so there's a lot of things that are going on here um but we can um we can construct this table in our tables within the framework that we have talked about um and we're just gonna because this is not an advanced training we're gonna just assume the existence of a couple of functions full code for those functions is provided and we have it's available and we have links to that um in this slide right here um so if you go down to if you follow this link there will be a section this the beginning of the section is basically the same as what i just walked you through but then later in that section all of the code that we're using here um is available and i'm also it's not currently in the um supplemental code.r but i am going to push that right after the workshop um I'll update that to have that code as well. But suppose that we have, it's actually two of them. We have the Cox model main element direct and we have the Cox model element direct. Um, and so what that is going to do, is, it's actually going to do a, a number of things. Um, one is it's going to cache the model so that each model is only going to be fit one time. Um, and then the other thing that it's going to do is it's going to extract a particular named aspect of the model, um, which are these, you know, these things that we have across the top. So either the N or the hazard ratio, confidence interval, the, you know, the P value or the interaction P value. Okay. So then our table ends up being something like this. So this, the block up on the top just has to do with, um, 
you know, some. Maybe, maybe some... very quickly, somebody's confused. Um, it's, okay. multi it's multiple Cox models. So every time you see hazard ratio, it's a different Cox model. I mean, um, yes. You. Um... Yeah. So going back um, here, um, so we have um, the top is a single overall model, I believe. Um, and then that model is fit with an age covariate and then it's fit with a race covariate. So there's, I believe three models, which are these three here. Um, so you've got the overall one at the top that just has the treatment. They all have treatment, but the top one only has the treatment. And then the covariate ones have the treatment and separately either the age covariate or the race covariate. And then the interaction is between treatment and that and covariate? Correct. Yes. Um, I don't, I can't speak to the biostatistical decisions that go behind this table. I didn't design it. I just, um, I just recreated it in the framework, but this was designed by biostatisticians at Roche. So I assume that whatever they're doing is a smart thing to do. Um, but yeah, so there are multiple models. In fact, there are three models. There's there's one for each covariate where it has, as you say, both the covariate, like the covariate interacted with the with the treatment. And then there's the one that just has the treatment, which is the sort of base model. Um, yeah, so the the code. Um, Adrian, can you track down the, just load up your slides and, and copy the link. The, the link is in the slide deck. Um, the, the code to the model? The, yeah, this, this right here. Oh, yes, okay. Or I guess maybe I can. Well, well, that's, yeah, you have to it. kind of, you have to search it from there. Um, yeah, so this is the start of the section that has the, the code in it. So just I think, move I think the full there. reproducible code without copy paste, like we've had multiple copy paste, gave it posted off. Yeah, I will I have it added to my local. Um and I'll I'll show you guys this in a second. But I have it to my I have it in my local supplementary code.r and I will push that. Now one thing to be aware of is it does require turn. Um because as we said, turn is where the statistical logic is implemented. Our tables does not implement any particular statistical logic besides very basic, um, you know, count percent type things. Um, but turn is open source, so you can install it, but you will need to install it um, to get this code to run. But then what we have, um, and I'm gonna, I'll show you guys this code in a second, um, is, we have a layout that has is split by multivar, and we're just sort of tricking it. We're saying the variable is study ID the whole time because we don't really care what the variable is. But the labels are these guys here, um, the n hazard ratio, et cetera. Um, and then the model elements are these here. And the reason we're doing this is because these aren't real variables in the data set, so it would complain if you told it. If you tell it to split using a variable that's not in the data set, it complains. So because that doesn't exist. So um, right. So here we have this. Um, the caching is more related to the advanced training. Like you could do this without the caching, and it would just fit the model multiple times. But I didn't want to do that. That's not satisfying to me. So I wrote I wrote an analysis function that actually does caching, and it was fairly straightforward to do. And in fact, it will probably be done automatically in some cases in our tables in the future, but it is not right now. Right now, it's something that you would build yourself. So those are the that. And then you got the summary of the overall model. Um, this is a summarized row groups, which means it would be repeated. If we wanted it to not be repeated, it could also be an analyze call and otherwise look exactly the same, in which case, it, the, the row would still show up, but it would not be repeated. Um, and then we pass it by covariate. Uh, we say split rows by multivar, and that these are real variables, so we don't have to pretend, right? The variables are age and race. 
And then we have labels for our variables. Um, we have the split label, um, which is just covariate here. That's often not um, displayed, but in this case, we are displaying it. And then the indent mod is just what the indent mod does here um, is it makes these line up. It makes Asian line up right under race. Um, so you can control, like by default, Asian would be indented from race. Um, and for whatever reason, the, the biostatisticians, the medical writers or, or what have you didn't want that. They wanted that to line up. So you can, this is an example of, you can fully control the, the indenting to, to move things around if you don't like where they show up by default. So that's that. Um, and then we summarize that again. That's the, that's the covariate summary. The level, and then we have analyzed, which um, the analyze is what gives us those one or multiple rows for the individual effects. Okay, so maybe if you go, if you go yeah, step back, gonna... if you go a step back, I think the most important piece here is you see the invocation of the modeling node. It's in analyze call was in summarize and summarize. So it's a right. It's a kind of clever use of group summaries and then the um right and this colors. this illustrates the fact that like so so there's multiple ways to get columns that behave differently right if you need them to right like by default like the sort of default basic thing is like rows will behave differently but columns will be sort of um or sorry, yeah, different rows will behave differently, but within a row, the cells are all sort of have the same meaning. That's that's the default. If you do split rows by and then analyze mean, right? Like that, that's the mean row, and then all of the cells in the row are means for the different columns. Um, and that's very powerful, and that can get you a lot of tables. But not all tables are like that. Some tables, as we know, have columns that actually have different meanings so this is an example that you can do that as well this is a again this is a very advanced example um so this is also i will say we are like 90 percent of the way done with transforming this example into a vignette that will ship with our tables so not right now it's still it's i mean you could look in the pull there's a pull request for it already but in the future like there will be a vignette that actually walks through this in in full detail um and, and but, so maybe that's that's also here then to pitch the like that pattern where you have a simple where you have an analysis function you can reuse it in various parts and analyze and summarize uh, row yeah. groups. That's the same with adverse event. You find that pattern often that really all the complexity of applying the same model or same summary at different levels um, gets you quite far. Um, um, which um, I think if you read the clinical trials tables vignette or the table page, you see a similar pattern. Um, so that. Caitlin, that may be the case. Like I said, like I, I'm not a, you know, practicing clinical biostatistician, um, so I can't. I can I can tell you that the um, the modeling function is being called three times in the construction of this table, but I don't. Um, I don't know the details beyond that. Um, I can make sure I will make sure that that's in the vignette though. Um, once that's merged in, um, but we're sort of at the limit of my my knowledge about exactly what this table is doing. Um, because again, I didn't design the table. I just implemented the table based on the specification that I saw. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and um, let's go ahead and share my R Studio. And we can um, yes, I want to yes, I want to reload it. All right, so I've copied all this stuff here. This is again, this is complicated, so like, don't 
be intimidated. The vast majority of analysis functions aren't going to look like this. And the vast majority of analysis functions that do look like this will be written by biostatisticians and then simply used. Then it'll put in somewhere like turn, and then they'll simply be used when you're actually constructing tables. Um, so here's the cached model, which just says um, the, uh, the formula is the arm times covariate. Um, and the covariate can either be, um, yeah, the, and then we, um, and then we'll fit that. So this is the cache model. So it, it receives an environment and then it checks if that, if the model for that covariate exists already, if it does, grabs it. If it doesn't, it fits it again. Um, and then it prints it just so that we know that it's being called. Um, and then it puts it in the cache so that it will, it will get it next time. So if we run this, um, and then this, the details of exactly what this is doing is are not important. The What this is doing is it receives what model element you want, so which column you're in, essentially. Um, and then it grabs that information from the um, from the um, from the model object, and then it like figures some stuff out, and then it it calls in rows. Well, um, and, so, and so the documentation of what the modeling exactly does in, is in the term function, if you go up there. Yeah, but the, this term function is not explored. So the, these are, but again, there's a vignette that doesn't use triple colon and is like explains what's happening here in more detail. Um, this this was this is from a training for the people who write turn, which is why this is so much more complicated and crunchy than the other examples that we have. But I thought that it was still valuable to show that you could do it, which is why it's in here. But so if you're a little lost about exactly what this function is, don't worry. That's not that's not unexpected. And that's not the point of me showing this to you, right? Like the, the, the exact details of how this function works are beyond the scope here. So we're just going to say that it does work. Um, and then we're going to um, and then we're going to use it. So we run that. And then we have, I have turn installed locally. I also have the RCD archives that we need for this particular table to get it out. Um, these are turn functions that um, do some stuff dealing with how missingness is, is coded. Um, then we're going to filter both um, ADSL and ADTTE. And then this is another function that's for the main effects. Um, and so here, here we're back to the thing. We've got environment. So then we build our layout. Uh, we can look at our layout here. Um, so these are, you can see bars here. That's the multi-bar thing. Again, these are pretend variables, right? Because we can't actually say N and hazard ratio and things like that because those aren't in the data. But that's what the labels for these columns will be. And then for split, we have um, age, race, and then we have call var analysis, which is like, this is an analysis, but which variable is being analyzed depends on the column. So that's what that means. And then we do build table. Um, and we can see that this is um, running that. So that says that. I guess it's interacting with itself, which doesn't make a ton of sense. But um, you can see each of these is one time. And then these this is the table that came out. So we've got our different columns, which have different meanings. Um, and this is this actually comes from the TLG catalog, I believe. Um, and it recreates the values that are there. So um, I don't remember which what the name of table is in the TLG, but it's in there. So again, um, the details of exactly what this function is doing are not really the point here. Um, but you can see that we have a lot of flexibility in terms of columns, meaning different things. We have a lot of flexibility in terms of, you know, 
um, different levels of summaries. Um, and here it looks like I'm not doing the the indent mod. So you can see actually by the default, this this indent mod is is right here. I think that's um, also the, that's also the correct indent. I would say this is the I, I like this def, I like yeah. this indent better personally. But um, you can also see we're using the labels for the variables rather than because this is the sex variable or sorry the race variable, not the sex variable. This is a race variable, but it's labeled ethnicity. This variable name the, the variable is all caps A G E, but we have a label that's not fully capitalized here. Um, and then we don't have the treatment thing here. We we could add that like the treatment colon thing there, but um but yeah so that is um a very advanced worked example um again if you're a little bit lost on the details of that don't worry about that that's not really the point here the point is that you can do it and then you can sort of become a power user of our tables and do that or the other point is like this this is the type of function that would be in turn and then you would just use it from turn without having to worry about exactly what it's doing. So, so that's another another way in which we don't really have to worry too much. Um, and then I'm going to switch back. Uh, let's, uh, Beth, yes, there are. Um, you can add titles and footnotes, and you can also, as a completely separate piece of functionality have referential footnotes in either on either columns, rows, or cells. So all of that stuff is supported. I don't think we have a slide or code for it in this presentation, but it is all supported, yes. And I think and, even uh, did we did we already add the page one out of five in the in the uh, no page numbering is a forthcoming feature. That one's not in yet. Yeah. But yes, um I think the so the cell value referencing and it's not just cell it's row column and cell yeah value row label reference. column label or cell all mm -hmm. of them can have so, footnote references which are different than footer materials which is like uh, you know file analyzed equals whatever like provenance style stuff but that gets all that that goes all into pagination um and gets repeated um yeah yeah and when you paginate the it it understands that only the referential footnotes that are relevant to the page get printed on the page and they take up space and that's that's accounted for in the algorithm so like all that all that stuff works and is supported so the final section um yeah so the final section here um is another one of those these bleeding edge features which is, you know, this anal this concept of an analysis reporting data set. Um, and so as we've talked about and shown in a couple of different cases uh, and in a couple of different ways, um, our tables objects are not data frames, right? They're just not. They're not data frames. Um, they are complex structured objects that have a ton of information in them. You actually, we haven't even really scratched the surface of all of the information that they retain and allow you to interact with once you've constructed a table. And so we'll probably do a little bit of that with whatever time we have left, in, including while we're answering um, Stephen's question, I think, which I haven't forgotten about. But there are other times when people want a data frame, right? Um, and so for a long time, so we've had some form of export as a data frame for a long time, but it wasn't really in the form that people really liked. So I've now written an ARD. So analysis for data set is, is typically, um, we use the ARD acronym. So an ARD export, trend, like extractor, essentially. Um, so an ARD is a data set, not a table object which contains all of the computed values that make up all of the cells, in addition to enough metadata to identify where those go in the table. Uh, that's a very short description of what an ARD is. Um, and we'll see what I mean by that in just a second. Um, so, 
so yeah. Um, and then, so ARDs sort of aren't really real yet. Um, so currently there's no specification for the format or contents of an ARD. I know that, that CDISC is working on one, but it is not currently a formal specification. Um, there are pharmaceutical organizations that have some form of these internally. Um, but typically from what I have seen, these often don't have a unified structure, even within an organization. So ARDs for different tables will have sort of different incompatible structures. And they certainly don't agree across organizations, even for the same table, they, the different organizations will be um, representing that information in different ways. Um, to what extent, you know, CDISC is going to step in and solve that with a formal specification is unclear yet. Again, they are thinking about one, but there is no, as far as I'm aware, there is no current spec or even sort of um, candidate spec. Like there's there's some work towards it, but it, it's not, it hasn't been fully formalized yet, I don't think. Um, the reason that people want ARDs, sometimes, like often people are thinking of ARDs as being a step before the table. So like you create your ARD and then you like feed that into the table engine. That obviously from everything that I've just said over the course of the past two and a half hours is not how our tables is gonna view ARDs. Um, but there are still some benefits um primarily that you can then do further analysis or visualization of the values that appear in your table um and that you can then you can store those values in a sort of ubiquitously supported format which is CV csv in that case um so um the we can now generate what I am calling ARDs. Again, ARD is not a formal specification that I was able to work against at this point. Um, but I have something that you can generate that has the information I think will go into the ultimate ARDs. Um, it accepts a table object and it returns a sort of what a semi-wide data form. Um, so the columns in the table are different columns in the ARD, but the all the row fastening information is sort of built into metadata columns. Um, so this is a very this is this is sort of just a little bit of historical trivia. This is the first really complicated table I ever wrote in R tables as a test for all of the features working well together. Um, so this is probably the oldest non-trivial table that exists in the modern R tables framework. And so it's used in various places in our tests. Um, so what happened, what's happening here is you have, you split by race and then you split by another variable um, and then you analyze age, and then you analyze age again, just because. Um, and then, not nested within those splits, you have another analysis of a variable which has two levels, and then you're going to count those. So that's what's happening here. Um, so you have multiple levels of nesting. You have some analyzer rows that are nested within those levels of, of faceting. You have other, other analyzer rows that are not nested within those rows. Um, and you have group summaries going on all over the place, which you can see which all the, with all the percents going on there. You have multi-valued cells. So there's a lot of stuff going on. So um, if you call, so this is just like you call it as ARD. Um, there's a bunch of columns, so I'm, I'm trimming a little bit of them out. Uh, but basically what ends up happening is it gives you back a data frame where the first, sorry, yeah, so this is the sort of metadata section of it. Um, and so you've got, you know, split variable one and then split value one and split variable two, split value two. So it has detected that there's two level, the maximum level of splitting is two. 
and then you have the avar name which is the name it's a little bit different it's the name of the um of the sub table so you can see here it's age redux instead of age um that may change in the future um the exact specification here is still experimental um but you've got that and then you've got the row name which is going to be like the what's printed for the individual rows um and then you have the row number which is the absolute position in the overall table so you can see that um three is skipped here because three is a variable label row that doesn't have any cells um so it goes one two and then four all right because if you go back here nope go back three no three the third row here is the row that says age analysis right it doesn't have any values and since it doesn't have any values it doesn't appear in the ard um so then um we have the marginal group summaries we, which are marked as such and you can also tell because um the avar name is no is na i should say um you can also see that for the for the higher level summary the summary of of race white um the second split is also na because it doesn't it doesn't have a second split right because it, when we're when we're here um this first this first row we don't have a value for the for the level for the for level a right or level b like we don't have a value for that split at all because we're outside of it we are we are at a higher level of of hierarchy um so but that and that's captured by putting these na's here right um and then we have the analyses that are nested within those splitting right so this is capturing all of that we've got race white factor 2a and then we've got two rows for age which are mean and median and then age redux is range um and then you know these are not group summaries which is marked there um and then we have the non-nested analyses right so these it is going to correctly say you don't have any value for any of these splits um you just have you're analyzing bar three and then you have level one and level two there um so that is the ard as it's um as it exists um and so as i said there's no formal specification for ards right now which means exactly the what exact form that they are in and whether or not you know the names of the columns and things like that are ever sort of formalized um is something that may happen in the future but is not happening right now um so the way that i've solved that is that that as as ard accepts a specification a spec argument um and right now the only specification that it accepts is v0 underscore experimental so anything that that ends in underscore experimental is going to be subject to change but once that is crystallized that will be that will change into just v0 with no experimental and that will be available forever right so if there's a new spec that comes along that will be v1 and it will start as, as v1 experimental and then when we settle on that then it will sort of be v1 so like you'll always be able to get back to previous versions of what our tables thought an ard was um that's that's the guarantee that we're providing including any bugs that were in that right so even bug fixes are going to bump the version number so you will get exactly the same output for v0 forever um and yeah so that's that's the concept of ards um i can run you i can show you guys that in practice um i mean it's it's honestly not that exciting um it's exactly what you just saw in the slides but just for completeness uh, or, or, or we have half an hour now for question i think half of the people here on the call are not um 
all yeah, well, I mean, it's also very, fa- it's a single function call. So like, I'll just do it very quickly and then we'll, then we'll address the questions. Um, all right, so here we have our, this is our big complicated table, uh, which is the reason we're not using x is because these are straight out of our tests. Um, and we got table, there's our table. And there's our ARD. And there you have it. So the other thing to note is that like these are multi-valued cells right now. Um, but that's a simple tidy R unnest longer call to fix that if you want if you want to fix that. Um so one thing um that I will that I'll sort of address from from Steven's question now is um so the because our tables is not a data frame our tables object our tables tables are like complex objects you can actually ask it what the labels and levels are so this is this is our table right so we can see that we don't have you know we don't it, it doesn't tell us that this is race like we can understand because we know what caucasian is we know that's a level of race but if we do row paths um now suddenly we can see oh okay this is race and then white and then content which is content is what we call the, the marginal group summaries um there are historical reasons for that we were doing it again, we probably call it something else, but that's what they're called. And it doesn't really matter because it, it doesn't make much of any difference. Um, so you can do that. You can ask it about what paths. And then these paths can actually be used to select elements out of the um out of the table. So if we if we do cell values of the table, this is all of the cell values, right? Um, and it gives you back, it gives them back as the list or nested list. Um, but, um, cell values accepts row path and call path. So let me see if I can do this easily. Uh, I'm going to cheat. Uh -huh. So that's the values for the first row for each of the columns. You can also select the columns. You can ask it about its column paths. It's like, OK, here are my column paths. And this, as you'll notice, has that information in it. Like, what is the name of the split? Now, another thing to keep in mind is usually splits will be um, splits will be simple partitioning based on a categorical variable. But that's not guaranteed. There are other types of splits. We saw one of them, which was the multivar split, but there are other types of splits. There are, you know, cut splits. So you can split by quantiles or, or other things like that. You can actually fully override what splitting is doing. So the only thing, and like that, if you if you search around in that in the link that I gave you for the code, that's a whole that's a that's an advanced training that actually talks quite a bit about um, customizing splitting behavior. Um, but the bottom line is the the facets are not faceting is generalized in our tables, so they are not um, they're not guaranteed to be partitions. Um, in fact, let's just load up the help for, um, so, so we have 20 minutes Gabe, to wrap yeah. it up and ask questions. Um, yeah. Well, so if, if you have, while I'm doing this, I'm, I'm doing this live or we're, we're, so like, if there are any questions, please type them in the question and we will answer them. I'm just showcasing additional stuff while we, while we wait for that. Well, there's a couple uh, of slides more to cover. Oh, are there? I thought yes, that was sir. the end of the. Yeah, it's not. Thing. It has, has some further topics and then. Okay, addition. right. Um, do you want to do that? Will I? Yeah, I'll I'll do that. Can I grab the screen share from yeah. you? Yeah, yeah. Good. So, 
Yes, it's the end of the scripted workshop. Um, I think, as you probably have guessed or gathered from the from how we talk about those topics, there's quite a bit more. Um, there's pagination, um, which is a fair big topic. There is rendering to different formats. There's sorting and pruning. Um, sorting meaning if you want to sort um, within a certain depth um, of rows, like an adverse events table. Um, pruning is if you want to remove like zero counts, for example. There's also things where you say, well, if I have a um, Medra dictionary now, I would like to have all the levels. So we have like this split to map. Um, there's pathing that Gabe just showed. There's table comparison topics. Like if you have two tables, you want to see what's the difference. Um, we have functionality to compare against baselines, um, which, which means you can define a reference column. There's a title footer that's already mentioned um, and custom splitting functions, quite a bit more. And, and um, so I think in this workshop, at least the beginning, we tried to be quite a bit more general um, to make it more accessible, I think, the workshop. Um, and But there's material in, in the vignettes, um, you can look at the R and Farmer workshop. That's a little bit deeper into our table territory. Um, um, yes, and then um, that advanced um, training that Gabe mentioned. And I think with that, let's look. We have to, we have now twenty minutes to yeah. answer questions um, let me let me let me share my screen and i'll run through the because i think this is going to this will be useful for people but while i'm doing this as adrian said any questions we are happy to answer them we have about 20 minutes so we definitely have time for questions um and i'm just gonna like showcase random things that come to mind about our tables while we wait for for those so the first thing that I think people will probably be interested in is how easy it is to add combination levels. Um, so here we're going to say um, we're going to define our combo levels in a what's called a combo DF, um, which is um, you, you have the you name the value because it's not one of the values the variable takes. And then you have a label, and then you specify which levels of the of the categorical variable you're combining, and then you don't really have to worry about this last one. This extra extra args is a whole thing, but you typically don't need it at all. Um, and then you say, "I'm going to split by arm, but I want to use those combo levels in addition to the combo levels that I the, the normal levels." And there you have it. That's that's all you need to do. There's no manipulation of the data. There's no duplication of the data. We now have additional. We have all of these are the, the same as before, and then we have these additional combination columns, like combo arm, like virtual combo arm type. And so, can you also uh, add the total when you're here? Once you're here, because you that's can. Yeah. So total is. Um, so you can add. So you can add total like as a there's a helper function that does this that adds total um which now i need to add what is it no add overall overall facet. level level facet level facet is for the when you're building your custom split functions level is for when yeah. you do the Yes, so if it, if it could, um, because that's the most often used, I guess. Yeah, that's the most often used. And you can you can do both, right? Like you can add it here, um, but you can also say, um, you know, LYT2. Or I'll go down to the bottom here because uh, I already have an LYT2 here. Uh, oh, I, I already have this. I don't even have to do anything. So um here we are splitting by arm and we have our combo levels but i'm only adding one just because i only feel like adding one and then for stacks we are adding a we're using add overall level to add an overall um thing so let's just run okay, that but that's that's within a split but 
overall, let's say if you have a simple arm and the total. Yeah, <laughs> so so that's I'll I'll get to I'll get there in just a second. Um so I guess I never actually built this. So T table two is build table um lyt2 and then small idm uh what did I... oh it helps if i define the data before i use it uh so here we go um so now i have all genders male and female and then we have um a, B, and A plus B. Now there is also, so this is distinct from, I want a something all the way off to the right that is just a column with all of the, with all of the observations in it. Usually this is the correct one. So like you can, you can add, um, you can add, you know the the overall level to arm and so then you could have an all arm but you can sometimes say i actually just want this but then i also want to like everybody all the way over on the right there and so that is a distinct thing which is like lit 3 b uh, and it comes right here Let me copy this um and then we say um at overall yeah i'm wondering why these are columns and not rows what's going on yeah so i'm actually yeah i, I don't want this one i want this one is though though there are some of the splits for rows we want the one where they're all columns so um then we say at overall call and what is the name of the column that we want? My uh, awesome overall. Or all subjects. Oh, yeah. Um, that. Um, and then you can see I made it really long, but now we have our awesome overall call that has everybody in it. And that's all the way off to the right. So that's not nested under any of the arms, um, which you can see. TBL uh, two, yeah. See, no, no arm, no arm here. So that's the difference between an overall level and an overall column and R tables gives you easy ways to do both. Um, so there's a question yeah. about exporting a table. Can you show that? Yes. Um, um, so how do I want to do this? I, I think we even have a, we, 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 don't we have from the last workshop the export with pagination and everything? So exporting by default involves pagination. Um, uh, that's true. We need a table. Well, I mean, we could just use this know. table, but um, to be able to. So this is probably well. This this obviously won't paginate vertically because there's only one row in it. It may or may not paginate horizontally. My suspicion is that it is going to, but um, we'll see. Um, and then so like uh, res equals that and then or no first we'll do uh let, let's take let's take a demographic like table from the vignette let me see well, that. um yeah so the file equals uh, what what where am i oh sorry yeah wd Eh, whatever, that's fine. Um, okay, um, and then you want a demographics table from the vignettes. So that involves us going over here 
Oh, I'm not actually in. Um, yeah, you can see my super gross lots of files going on here, but um, let's well, see. I'll, I'll send you a quote. Um, or should, should I do it? I got it. I just need to. Come on. What are you doing? There we go. I just need to get to where I have our table checked out. Good here. I'll send you the code in chat. Okay. Thank you. Uh, give me a second. This is the clinical trial vignette. Um, it's a couple of things you have to copy out. Um, so I've sent it to you in, in Google Chat. Yeah. Let me just grab that. If you create a new file. Yeah. New file. Come on. Um, yeah, the plus. So you are, you're that. ridiculous. Um, new file. New file. Thank you. Good. All right. So we're just renaming this because we feel like it. Because um, <laughs> uh, we wrote the set, we wrote the code first, and then we were like, oh, well, that's not what it's named. So um, this is the summary function. Um, and then here's our table here, um, right? So you've got age, and then you've got two variables that are being summarized. Sorry, this is gender, female, male. And then within female and male, you've got two variables that are being summarized. Uh, so this is still a relatively simple table and by our table standards, but you can see that there, there is quite a bit of structure going on here. Um, and then we can just do export as PDF of what did I, yeah, I called it TBL. And then I named the file equals, what is it? TMP file. Yeah. Can you open that file then? So we see it. Yeah, I will. Yeah. Uh, so we've got that and then if we open that uh, i don't I hopefully this will actually I've, I've, i think you can't open it from our studio yeah no, fine i will stop sharing my screen and open it in a different thing just give me one moment um and so the and so the other formats usually we, you if you want to import it into um powerpoint or um latex and so on you can export it to flex table um no, rtf no. you can also i think flex table i think soon we will release the i think the gt conversion coercion that you can yeah. use gt's rtf um function but gabriel yeah. what gabriel well, shown essentially second. it's is it working? Should I, should I share it? Um, let, let me let me do it. Yeah, you, you do it. Um, okay, so um, share screen here. Desktop one with ten minutes. Um, so so essentially export as PDF a table, um, and then you give the file. You give it a um, table. Oh, yeah, I'm PDF. Not sure you can say that you can say ladder, you can say it's landscape or not landscape, you can give all this um you can give all this um information that will then do this, you can open this um and it will look it didn't like didn't actually work for me, so I'm not sure, so, but so yeah, yeah, so you've got it there. And so this one fits on one page. If it doesn't fit on one page, it will then it would do the pagination it. and it would repeat the rows. So um I guess why don't you paginate like just call paginate table well, um I, and give it a shorter it, thing i can make it landscape equal true and then it will paginate it i, I assume too 
to show that. So there we are. Yeah. And so the important thing here, actually, if you look at, um, if we zoom in here, um, so those are those are context. Um, and so if it gets split in between, you can say the number of siblings, not that it doesn't get breaking up. Like he, he said, needs at least two. I don't want to have N in itself on the previous page. Um, so the number of siblings, if you do that, then um, undifferentiated age gets repeated if if you're in undifferentiated, we are not in undifferentiated. But if it would get split between medium and high, which it doesn't, um, it would repeat U and biomarker. So it keeps its context when it paginates it. Why don't you set the, set the font size to something bigger so that we can try to see it. Yeah, I think it's still not enough. Um, still not enough. Um, siblings not it, ne it will never break it here because we don't have enough siblings oh so just do um min siblings equals zero and then it will force it to do that no see what is it what what's the argument um it's 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 uh, it's, it's a dot 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 but it's um min siblings equals zero should work min underscore siblings because it should just be being passed to, um... there you go. Yeah, so now it gets split um, after N. Um, and so if you go to the thing here, you see. Yeah, it's repeated. So you and H are repeated. You and H are repeated. So then you know what that, you know, that that first quote unquote first line, the, the um, the mean, you know what that's talking about, right? Whereas if you just truncate, then that you and age wouldn't be there, so you wouldn't you wouldn't know what the what the mean meant. Um, so that's what we mean by context preserving pagination. Yes. So I'll, I'll answer this as next question here. I'll answer this here. Send. So is it possible to super to use sub sup and superscripts not in ASCII? You could do it export it to LaTeX. It's though that won't be a uh, yeah. Uh, so so we we it, target but... ASCII. ASCII does not have subscripts and superscripts. It also doesn't have ligatures, which is another thing that we have been asked about. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason for this is um, we don't really care what font you use. But our tables needs the font to be monospaced in order for the pagination that we just saw to the machinery to work. Um, and so superscripts and subscripts aren't in monospace, right? Because they don't take up a full character width. Um, yes. So that's also why ligatures aren't um, aren't in um but yeah so so currently no you would not be able to use subscripts and superscripts any any other questions or or general comments um yeah we have about four minutes left um any questions or comments otherwise thank you for the attendance um our table is open source. Uh, you can go to here. Um, also, Gabe is a consultant. Feel free to reach out to him, um, which actually yep. haven't provided your contact. Um, you can add them to the slides. Yeah, I'll add it to the slides. And um, yeah, I hope that was useful. Um, if you have feedback for our table, um, if you have technical feedback, um, I guess any feedback, but mainly, yeah, um, would be good if you can yeah. go and ra raise features it. that features that you think we might not have. Probably a lot of them we do have because, again, like our tables is a powerful system. So, um, yeah, so you can you can, you can raise an um, issue so you can do a that. lot of things, including stuff that we did not showcase here. Um, but if there are features that you might need, you know, please feel free to open an issue on the our tables repo, like we we address. 
issues. We, we respond to issues quickly. We address feature requests that are straightforward quickly. Feature requests that are much more complicated, we would then engage with you to see you know, what we can do that, that would meet your needs. Um, but again, the R tables can do most of what you see, the overwhelming majority of what you see in clinical trial reporting and table in the table context. Uh, there also is, just as a very, very, very brief plug with no slides, there is also an R listings package, which is much simpler and is designed specifically for listing. Um, so you can look up at that. That's on CRAN as well, um, but we don't have any time to get into that today. Good. I think um, this is it then. Um, right. Thank you very much. Sounds and, great. Um, Thanks think... everyone for uh, for your attendance and your questions. Hopefully this has been useful. Um, and if you have any questions, like we said, please reach out.